Anthropologist astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe, at your Amherst kitchen table, you are going to South Africa to the Conference of the International Astronomical Union, the organizing body responsible for killing Pluto as a planet. So is that why you're there to go and redeem Pluto as a planet? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the General Assembly, and you're right that in 2006, this was the I should say, infamous body that demoted Pluto. But I was looking at the program. So this is the largest astronomical meeting of astronomers all around the world. People come from uh, everywhere. And there is at least one presentation or, uh, or poster. Actually, I think it's a presentation that actually brings up the question of definition of planets again. Ah. And I looked at the... So I, I, I mean, I would love to uh, attend that, uh, but I think it's after I come back. But nevertheless, that particular abstract talked about the challenges with the definition they approved that it poses for exoplanets. Because by that definition, many of the planets around other star systems may not qualify as planets. So the abstract, I mean, to me, reading between the lines, so I would love to talk to the person who uh, is presenting it, was something like, I'm not trying to recreate the controversy, but I want clarity that what is the IAU position on the definition of planet? So I think there is a little bit of rekindling of that. So Because it was controversial because everybody, most people were gone when they voted on that, right? And then all of a sudden this big announcement comes out that Pluto is no longer a planet. So several thousand astronomers attend this. Uh, and on the last day when they demoted Pluto, only a few hundred were left. So, I mean, and, you know, I mean, you may think, hey, this is an important decision. In theory, you would put it on the earlier part when you make sure that most people are there. Yeah. Unless there is something sinister going on. <laughs> what are you there to present? Um, as we have talked about, I create uh, videos for uh, audience in South Asia, in Pakistan as well, uh, in Urdu. And we have a subsection of those videos directed at kids. And, uh, and in fact, those kids' videos are now going to be in English as well in a few months. But right now we are presenting how we are doing those videos, what kind of things you have to take into account in particular. The challenge is most videos, astronomy and science videos for kids are in English and for Western audience made by uh, Western media companies. But if you want to communicate astronomy, you have to talk to the local audience and with local cultural references. So in our uh, poster that we are presenting, that is, the, that is something that we are trying to emphasize how crucial it is and how we managed that challenge on how to bring in cultural humor, cultural uh, and, and sort of like you know, animated figures, uh, cultural hosts. So I mean, like, you know, we have hosts from Pakistan. How do we bring that in and what role does it play in communicating astronomy and science? Well, you do such a great job communicating astronomy in English to us here in the 413. But today we're talking about the moon once again and a fascinating discovery on the moon. And we have been talking a lot on the moon and it's partly because we are interested in it and because there is a lot of uh, there are there are a lot of projects, there are a lot of plans for going back to the moon, including settlements on the moon, perhaps by 2030, um, going to the moon before that with Artemis program here, uh, US led, but also there are Chinese missions uh, to planning on going back to the moon. Um, and one of the big factors is, if you have a permanent settlement on the moon, how are you going to be protected by the temperature extremes that are there. Moon doesn't have an atmosphere. So your daytime temperature can be very hot. It could be 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So a little bit like today. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it, it is hot, but not, I mean, it's in the 90s. So you can imagine if it's going to be 250 degrees, well, that's a tad bit hot. Yes. And then when- Your blood would boil, right? Or, I mean, water yeah, boils I mean, at 212. And, yeah. and then you have the nighttime temperatures, which can be a minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Also too cold. Also too cold. Sounds so, like New England. <laughs> the right. moon is New England. <laughs> so, uh, and I think New England astronauts would do just fine. <laughs> just rub some dirt on it, you'll be fine. And so 
you have these uh, temperature extremes and then because you don't have a protective atmosphere, you have also uh, cosmic rays which come from sort of like the galaxy, but also from the sun. You have radiation from the sun that you are not uh, protected from. You also get these micro meteoroids because there is no atmosphere. So any piece of rock, any piece of thing that's coming in high speed. It would have burned up in our atmosphere and become a shooting star, which happened all the time. But there, it's just coming at your head. It's just coming to <laughs> hit you. I mean, small things won't do, but they were constantly being coming and you won't be make, able to make any wishes because yeah. you won't see a shooting star. That's so sad. The star will just hit you. <laughs> So, <laughs> I wish, that would be the only I wish. wish the star wouldn't hit me. <laughs> so there are all these challenges. So when we are thinking about humans with a permanent settlement on the moon, you have to think about how they are going to be. And we talked uh, recently actually about uh, Legos, like, you know, the 3D construction, how they're going to make that. And so there are plans to create housing or settlements like, you know, that is uh, that protects, takes care of all of these things. But just recently, astronomers reanalyzed data that was taken in 2010. There's a Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO. This is a NASA uh, mission uh, that took a lot of images, radar images of the moon. Uh, I think it also was partly responsible for discovering water on the south pole of the moon or water ice on the south pole of the moon. So it's really crucial. But they, some scientists reanalyzed the data and it just got published in Nature Astronomy. And they knew that there were some sort of like pit-like areas on the moon. There are about 200 of those. But they weren't sure how deep they were. And they analyzed one, which is actually uh, very close to where Apollo 11 landed in Mare Tranquilitatis. Uh, and it's the Mare Tranquilitatis pit. So it's the uh, Sea of Tranquility pit. <laughs> <laughs> so they... We analyze it and it looks like from an angle because it's a radar and they bounced it back from it. Uh, what they find is that, well, this is actually a hole that connects to potentially a sort of like, you know, um, basically it's a cave uh, which connects to a network underneath of deeper tubes. So instead of having to build housing out of Legos on the moon, which would be awesome. 3D printing Legos to build housing, they might have already built housing on the moon in these caves in the Sea of Tranquility. Right, and the question is, well, why are they there? Well, these are lava pits because there was volcanism on the moon and these mare, which people used to think that's why they were called um, seas because on from from the earth they look like darker areas and uh, and uh, at the time sort of like you know, people thought, oh, they must be seas or oceans, but it turns out to be basalt. Uh, which is coming from lava, and that's a bed of that. And so there was volcanism a few billion years ago on the moon. And so you have these lava tubes. So this particular one that they have mapped in, in, an, in an interesting way, it has about 300 feet wide. That's the opening. So that's actually pretty decent. Yeah. Uh, and then actually it has steep walls uh, that go down and uh, about, 100, uh, about a couple of hundred feet actually they go down. And, uh, and so that's maybe a place which can actually provide all of the protections that we are talking about from, uh, from these various dangers of being on the moon. But if I were like a giant sandworm, that's where I would live. <laughs> and maybe we just haven't found them yet because they're underneath the ground on the moon. Uh, well, uh, that that is true. Or maybe they are the ones who created it. That's we right. don't know. They have like, no. We so, should send the Kwisatz Haderach up there. <laughs> Moab Deeb. Right needs to go and tame this worm. Well, so talking about this connection to the desert, uh, I mean, these, the, the reason why astronomers are inter excited about it is that these kind of lava tubes exist here on Earth. Uh, there are in Hawaii, of course, like, you know, and, and, and you can visit those. Not the ones where the lava is coming out, but yep. the ones that lava did come Leave out. Leave those for a couple more million years. Th that's exactly right. Actually, yeah, maybe less than that. But there is uh, recently a paper came out uh, a few months ago, which actually uh, talked about uh, there is a tunnel system, lava tube tunnel system, or lava tube system in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's called Umme Jirsan which is about, uh, I think, a few uh, hundred miles, uh, but a few hundred miles uh, north of Medina, one of the uh, holy cities uh, in Islam. And there they found um, a tube which is about a mile long. 
and it's an underground tube and about uh, 40 feet tall. And so you can actually go in there. And, uh, and what they found is that humans were living there a few thousand years ago. Mm. So that's really interesting because so you can actually see how humans might have used these type of locations just like you and I are thinking right now. Hey, actually Lava Tube is a good place to be well, on the moon because it protects from other things. But you can also imagine a few thousand years ago on the Earth, especially in warmer locations and stuff like, you know, well, that would actually protect them from extreme temperatures and you can be down there and you can be protected from animals, figuring it out, like, you know, that you can actually have protection around it. And they found, in fact, cave art in there as well. So this is Neolithic or Stone Age um, inhabitants that were there. They had created some art as well. So this is a recent discovery, and that's a lava tube. My people, the Italians, have actually uh, worked in lava tubes for a very long time. They will go down these pipes, and then they'd roam around in these lava tubes, and they would look for this princess. But it turns out, <laughs> over and over again, their princess is in another castle. So they have to go through different other lava tubes until they can beat Bowser, the king of the Koopas. Wow, I did not know that, it's, but now I know. It's Super Mario Brothers. But, uh, well, <laughs> but, but, but maybe the princess is on the moon. Well, as a lot of cultures think, like, you know, so that's what uh, we, we see over there as well. So this is, uh, this is an exciting discovery, but there is a caveat to it. And the caveat is that the Sea of Tranquility where the Apollo 11 also landed, that is closer to the equator. But most of the water ice is closer to the poles. Mm -hmm. And so this, while this is interesting, they have identified about, I think about 200 potential pits that may be lava tubes. And what you need are these lava tubes closer to the South Pole. Uh, I mean, I think all the North Pole, but most of the emphasis is going to the South Pole, both the uh, American-led Artemis uh, program and Chinese-led uh, moon program, International Lunar Research uh, Site, I think, program. Uh, they are both planning for going to the Lunar South Pole. So that, in some sense, solves the problem of habitability. Where are they going to live if these lava tubes are available? I still like the Lego idea. Yeah, I know, but maybe you can still use Legos for constructing, um, like, you know, furniture. I mean, I think you will still need that. 